Hello, everyone. My name is Justin Gunther. I'm the director here at Falling Water. And thank you all for joining us today. This is in celebration of National Historic Preservation Month. And we're thrilled to have John Matteo with us to discuss his 20-year involvement with Falling Water's preservation. Now, when Frank Lloyd Wright designed Falling Water in 1935, 1936, he was pushing all conventional notions of residential living and stretching building technologies to their limits. And the result is something that is truly remarkable, an architectural and sculptural masterpiece, but certainly not a building without challenges. And John will walk us through some of those challenges today and discuss the innovative solutions developed by preservationists, architects, structural engineers to tackle Falling Water's unique preservation problems. As you'll see from John's presentation today, preservation work at Falling Water is ongoing. In fact, just last year, we completed an update, a 20-year update to our preservation master plan and identified a multi-million dollar need for numerous large-scale projects that we'll have to address in the near future. Of course, the current health crisis has put a hold on all preservation work here at Falling Water. Over the past 10 weeks, with the site being closed to our visitors, our revenues have essentially dropped to zero and maintenance has been reduced to its absolute essentials. That being said, if you can give today, we would greatly appreciate your support at any level of help. Then that will help us ensure that Falling Water's preservation is for generations to come. And you too then can become part of our preservation story. If you would like to donate, the web address is fallingwater.org forward slash donate. Again, that's fallingwater.org forward slash donate. And we'll also display that website um, at the end of the presentation. Before I turn it over to Scott Perkins, who is our Director of Preservation and Collections, he'll be introducing John. Just a few, a few housekeeping items. Please make sure that your personal microphones are muted. And during the presentation, please feel free to use the chat function to address us with any comments or tell us where you're signing in from. We'll track the questions throughout the presentation and then have a short Q&A at the end um, where you can interact with John. All right, Scott, I'll turn it over to you to make the introduction. Great, thanks, Justin. Well, it's my pleasure today to introduce John Mattia to you all. John is a founding principal and the principal in charge of restoration and preservation efforts at MCC 1200 Architectural Engineers, which is based in Alexandria, Virginia. During his career of more than two decades, he's balanced his professional work with academic pursuits to develop standards of practice for innovative and efficient designs for new construction, as well as project goals for historic preservation and renovation. John completed his BS and BA at Tufts University in Civil Engineering and the History of Art and Architecture, respectively, before completing an MS in Structural Engineering at Princeton University. Soon after, he joined Robert Stillman Associates, where he rose to the level of Director of Preservation for their Washington, D.C. office, and where he was soon joined with the team that began working to, quote, save falling water. He's published and presented widely on structural engineering for historic architecture, and for over the past decade has taught civil engineering courses at Johns Hopkins University. We're thrilled he's spending time with us today, and he'll be speaking on his projects at Falling Water uh, that he's worked on over the past two decades. So please uh, join me in welcoming John Matteo to our live forum, and I'm gonna turn it over to John. Thank you, uh, Scott and Justin. It's uh, uh, a great pleasure to talk about falling water and uh, my fortunate experience to, to be involved. So I'm gonna very quickly, so you don't have to see the inside of my uh, house here, we'll go right to, I'll share my screen and we'll go to this presentation. Let's see how this works. Um, all right. Let me just, okay. All right, so um, I'll let you take in this view for a minute and uh, before I get started. So, um, so Frank Lloyd Wright was hired by Edgar Kaufman 
a store owner in Pittsburgh to design a summer home at Bear Run in the Laurel Highlands of Western Pennsylvania. Uh, right, uh, visited the site once and, and wrote back to uh, Mr. Kaufman and, that he wanted to design a house that would be an accompaniment to the music of the stream. So I'm gonna keep going with that theme of this connection to the stream and also to the landscape uh, with this presentation. Um, right termed, uh, this is probably one of his best examples of what he called organic architecture. And uh, where the design is very much uh, responding to and integrated with the landscape. Um, and here you, with this image, I, I like this image in particular because you really get a, a sense of where the cantilever design idea comes from. And you see the natural rock formations at the waterfall, um, the, the local uh, uh, Pottsville sandstone um, typically is in layers and, and would cantilever. Uh, and I'll sh show you actually that, that that cantilever of the waterfall itself actually goes back pretty far. Um, I also, the design is, presents a clear hierarchy of building materials. The, it's an innovative early use of reinforced concrete in residential design. It's, um, it's not unprecedented, but it, it's early. And, um, and in hierarchically, typically used uh, reinforced concrete in the horizontal planes and uh, for all the spanning structures. Uh, and then that's supported either on some more reinforced concrete or more commonly uh, stone masonry, which you see on the left. And then uh, also there's steel and glass. So not only has it been a great pleasure and privilege to work at Falling Water and with its dedicated stewards, staff and fellow consultants, but especially to have been working under the mentorship and leadership of Robert Silman. None of this would have happened without his vision. For me, for me, Bob was one of the most important structural engineers of the 20th century because of his perspective towards the built environment. He saw the important role of structural engineers in preserving our architectural heritage, but also fundamentally as an issue of environmental sustainability. And uh, I think Bob was a lover of nature, very much like Frank Lloyd Wright was. And so I'm gonna talk about the house and the design, um, definitely from the perspective of a structural engineer. And I, uh, so I like this image of, uh, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright on the left with his apprentices, and this is from 1933. The uh, apprentice on the far right is uh, William Wesley Peters, who was an uh, architecture student and engineering student at MIT. And he, along with uh, some others, I think uh, uh, Mendel Glickman was one that did structural engineering in-house for right. And in the, in the picture, in this image from 1933, Peters is only 21 years old and Wright is 66 at the time. And this is uh, probably two years prior to the design of Falling Water, three years prior to the construction, which started in 1936 at Falling Water. So this is a view of uh, Bear Run looking up from the bridge at Falling Water. Uh, the stream, its sound and movements in time were clearly an inspiration to Wright's design of falling water. The stream is also a good metaphor for the work of structural engineers understanding an existing building, or a new one for that matter. Like water winding its way down a rocky slope, the flow of forces through a complex structure can similarly follow varied paths. Whereas water follows the path of least resistance, forces in a structure generally follow the path of greatest resistance. 
Uh, this inverse analogy is so fitting that Hardy Cross, a legendary structural engineer of the early 20th century, uh, developed the same mathematical method to analyze indeterminate structures as well as to determine the flow of water in a series of conduits. So that little tidbit is for the structural engineers in the audience. So uh, this talk will keep that metaphor in mind. Um, and since we are talking about the last 20 years of preservation at Falling Water, I thought I would start closer to the present and higher up the hill, and then take us back in time, finishing with the work of the main cantilever of the house. So this is a, certainly an inviting image. This is at the guest house pool, which is uh, naturally spring fed. It, you can see down below uh, the main house in the distance uh, beyond the trees. Um, so we'll start up here and uh, within the last year or two, uh, year and a half maybe, um, there was a small project uh, at the pool actually and it was uh, trying to keep the water in the pool, which it was uh, working its way through the masonry. And uh, I, I like this image um, with the pool empty because it uh, also shows this sort of continuation of the cantilever theme uh, with these beautiful uh, step, stepping stones working their way down into the pool. So following our way down the hill, um, it's one of the, one of my favorite Parts of the design actually is this canopy that connects the guest house to the main house. And um, the image on the left is actually taken by some uh, people that were up working in the trees. And so they got a great perspective uh, of this part of the design. Um, the canopy and guest house actually were built. Uh, Later, they came in in 1939 after, after the main house was already constructed. Um, the design is really impressive of, of this canopy. It's a, a folded plate and the, the horizontal slabs are only three and a half inches thick, whereas each vertical step is a little thicker. It's five and a quarter inches in the, the vertical rises, but it, as it sort of steps its way down. The overall canopy is eight feet wide. And um, one of the most uh, surprising elements of the design when you're walking up is that it's only supported on the, the outer uh, perimeter. Um, and uh, so it has this naturally, natural imbalance in, in weight. Um, and there's an interesting quote in a book by uh, Donald Hoffman on falling water, which I'll read to you. I like this image because um, of the, uh, the, the sculpture with the, the imbalanced structure on the left, um, seemingly hoping that it's going to stand. Um, so I'll read the quote from Hoffman, which is the semicircular canopy tripped down the hill in a final allusion to the falls. Vigorously cantilevered, it folded plane, in folded planes, it recapitulated the structure of the main house. Mosher, uh, one of his uh, rights uh, assist, apprentice, apprentices, uh, wondered how it could be supported by steel posts only at the circumference. Wright raised his forearm, bent his hand to the horizontal, and demonstrated how difficult it was to push the hand any lower. But Peters, that's, that's Wes Peters, as I mentioned, had to make the actual calculations. And I think the, the interesting thing about this um, was indeed the, the aspect of the design and, and doing the calculations, I think really came into play here because uh, uh, as I'll show you, um, 
So one of the great resources we have in working at Falling Water is the collection of uh, original drawings. And so this is one of the drawings and uh, um, uh, you know, there's a lot going on in this. I think you can see my, my arrow here, but this is the plan view looking up from, looking at it from the sky, looking down of the stepped canopy. It integrates with the guest house on the, on the uphill side. Here's an elevation sort of stepping down. And then it uh, integrates at the bottom with a big masonry pier. The, the slender columns at each of the vertical steps is uh, actually this combined angle cross section, which is interesting in and of itself. Here's a, a shop drawing. Uh, it's called the shop drawing, which shows the the reinforcing layout within the concrete. Um, this is one of the vertical steps with bars at the top. So it acts, can act as a cantilever. Uh, but then these are all the bars that are in there working its way down. And uh, again, coming down to the bottom. And one of the interesting things is, you know, when I was first evaluating this is how, how does it work structurally? And thinking about this idea of the flow of forces through a structure. And one of the fundamental things to think about was this natural imbalance in load that you look at and when you sort of cut the, the canopy as a cross section through here and you're looking at one of the columns. Um, this, there's a tendency for the canopy structure to want to overturn to the right. And so as, when I first analyzed it, I assumed that it would have to be fixed at the, that post would really need to be fixed tight to make it, to prevent it from overturning. And then, but when I modeled it that way, it actually, the post was way overstressed. It would never work. And so um, I then looked at it differently. I said, well, why don't we unfix the post? We let it, let's let it be like a door hinge and rotate. So it wouldn't try to resist that eccentricity. And then what happened, whoops, jumped ahead. Um, actually found that it, it, it gathered, it obtained its stability by thinking of the design in three dimensions. And so in effect, this canopy, it's arched uh, layout and plan, uh, finds stability on either end at the guest house on the left and at this masonry pier at the bottom, which so it acts sort of like an arch in, a, in effect to maintain its stability. And, and uh, I think there are a number of examples at both at Falling Water and um, elsewhere where I think uh, Wright and his team definitely had a good understanding of uh, the benefits of, the, of how structures find resistance in the horizontal plane and what we call diaphragm effects in the structure. And um, so this is certainly one of them where the stability is gained by this in-plane arching action of the canopy. Um, and so again, we look at the, and, and look at the drawings uh, from the design. Um, clearly the designers were intending uh, for that resistance to take place. And they're, uh, so if we look at this reinforcing bar here, it actually, the bars that integrate with the pier at the bottom hook in. And so if we look at this connection at the bottom, here's the canopy coming into the masonry pier, the house beyond. And then if we look at the reinforcing that's in there, the red bars actually hook down into, the, into that pier and, and prevent it, the overall structure from sliding or rotating over. So clearly there was a design intent um, that was uh, fairly sophisticated in, in designing the structure. And the, the good thing about it is that's, this is one example of a structure that, um, that works very well, actually. Uh, it needs some routine maintenance from time to time, but uh, overall the structure does very well. So as we uh, wind our way down, you see on the image on the right, again, the canopy comes down and hits that pier. If I get my arrow here. And you can walk down the, the corridor into this area of the covered bridge, and which is the image on the left. 
and uh, actually there's a project that's actually still ongoing at the the covered bridge and um, there's a roofing project that's happening up here and uh, waterproofing down below and I'll mention uh, the person in charge of the design there is Pamela Jerome from Architectural Preservation Studio. Um, I think I, I like this analogy of water and the flow of force through structures because sometimes it's it's uh, it certainly seems like dealing with the flow of water and it's always it's varied pathways is at least as challenging if not more challenging than uh, than understanding the structure and how it works. But um, it's a it's an impressive design in itself. The the uh, the covered bridge on the structural side, because um, when you look at it again, th this part of the structure, as I mentioned, was designed later. It was um, 1939, and it was the bridge was originally intended to be a floor up at the at the at a higher level. So where the bridge hits the house now. Um, at the second floor level, it uh, really wasn't designed to carry the weight of the bridge at that spot. So um, the way the, the, the bridge itself is designed is actually as a cantilever again, which hooks into that masonry pier. So that this drawing, I don't know if you can tell that this is that masonry pier where the canopy hooks into, and this bridge also hooks into it. So there's a lot going on at this pier um, as sort of a structural fulcrum of a lot of uh, behavior going on. And I, I think the reality is that the, the bridge still butts up against the house and um, I, it probably doesn't work purely as a cantilever. It may be, it's a bit ambiguous and, and, and I think this is a repeated theme in understanding how the structure works at Falling Water is there is multiple potential load paths and load sharing that goes on. And um, I think this is one example where I'm sure some load goes into the house, whereas some aspect of it is, uh, is like a cantilever. Um, so in this image is actually standing below the covered bridge. So that's like right over our heads. And we're gonna look at um, one of the projects that happened in the, within the last year um, which is relating to this trellis over the, the drive on the north side of the house. And I, I like this image um, and this part of the design because really there's almost a perpetual flow of water coming down through the hillside and over the rock. And you can see that it's, it's very damp right now. If you were to walk through here in the winter when it's below freezing, this wall would be a wall of ice. And um, it's, uh, it's, it's really, uh, I think it uh, brings home this idea of, of where structure and water and, and landscape all come together and um, really reinforce this theme. Uh, I have a little video clip here. Let's see if this works. Um, let's... So yeah, I don't think the that visitor was expecting to be part of this little short clip, but um, I, I liked uh, actually the that you can hear the sound of um, her footsteps, and uh, but um, so 
this idea of water and structure and landscape coming together, uh, one of the unfortunate aspects is when we get excessive water into the into a structure, oftentimes that's the mechanism that leads to deterioration. So this area with the trellis is one area that did suffer from some deterioration over time. And uh, you can see in this curved beam, it's, it's one of the beautiful gestures of uh, Wright's organic architecture, working at this idea of the trellis working around the, the, the tree. Um, and uh, he did that on uh, a number of different occasions uh, with, with the design. But you can see the, the concrete's in, in poor condition here. Um, the reinforcing, the steel reinforcement that's in here is uh, rusting and when it rusts, it expands. So that moisture uh, leads to this problem and uh, resulting in cracking and, and spalling of the concrete. And you can see over here at the lights, these are, were also in very poor condition. So this was one of the recent projects. Um, so in, in coming up with the recommendations for this, we needed to look at how the trellis interacts with the rest of the structure. And there is a continuity of that structure. The trellis beams actually continue through the masonry and, it, and tie into a part of the design that's very much cantilevered off uh, and, and over the stream uh, and uh, create this imbalance in loading. So this diagram on the bottom right here, the blue is masonry, and then the, the, this is our reinforced concrete structure, which actually carries through. Um, so there was a question of to what extent the trellis is actually helping to tie back this part of the house into the hillside. And visually, it, it certainly does that. But uh, the question was structurally does it? And what we actually found was that, uh, you know, it certainly applies a certain, a certain amount of weight on the masonry um, on this end. So it provides some weight, but it's not, it wasn't anchored into the rock. So there must have been some other means of really uh, dealing with the imbalance and load. So we were looking at this heavy weight over here with the tendency to rotate again, just analogous to the canopy above where um, it, there's a tendency for overturning and, um, uh, and then the question is how does it uh, get its stability basically. And um, part of it is resolved with uh, uh, this wall here and some continuation of the, uh, of the structure to have a, a counterweight, but we found that it really wasn't quite enough. And even uh, the weight of the trellis here was not quite enough. So there were other factors in, in that were helping to give stability. Here's a basic, so this is like a cross section cut through the house Here's our driveway. Here's our wall with the water coming down. This is the trellis. And this is that large, so now we're looking, uh, you know, looking the other direction. And this is that large weight overhanging the stream. So when this wants to overturn, if we have a big weight over here, then that might be enough to keep it from turning over. Um, or if we potentially pull it back, so we found that it wasn't tied in here, and we also found that it wasn't quite enough weight over here. So we were looking for other ways that stability could be obtained. Um, and again, this is sort of one of these scenarios where there's multiple things contributing and likely multiple load paths to give it stability. But here, um, the, so this is a, a view looking down. Here's our canopy, here's our covered bridge. This is the trellis coming over um, and uh, over the driveway. And this is the, the, uh, the herb terrace and pottery terrace of, that is eccentric to the main supports. So again, like the canopy, there's this tendency for overturning here. Whoop, let me go back. And uh, I think again, what is helping provide stability is the diaphragm of the structure and thinking of this in three dimensions and how this 
a horizontal slab of the roof and the second floor and third floor um, tie into the main mass of the house and act as again like a, a cantilever in plan now and then that gets resisted by the main masonry walls of the house so um, I think it's a uh, you know it shows a, a very complex and sophisticated uh, idea of structure and achieving stability and some of those imbalances are are certainly done to great architectural effect and um, but uh, clever engineering to really um, make it all stable um, but given that ambiguity uh, and the large imbalance of loads we actually uh, shored up that part of the house and um, we replaced four of the beams um, because they were in such bad condition. The concrete was in really poor condition. So there's that. Here's another image of the, the beams from the canopy side. And, uh, and again, uh, here's the after image of them uh, coming together, uh, looking much better. The, um, the tree, you know, uh, on one level, unfortunately, you know, it um, periodically needs to get uh, replaced in order for it to really integrate with the, the original design. So in this case, the tree was replaced with a smaller version here. So this one will last for a long time in the future. Um, so we'll take a step back. So that was 2019. We'll step back now to 2004. And so now we're getting to uh, uh, closer to the, the projects where, um, um, where we were working with the main living room cantilever. Uh, this is at Edgar Kaufman Senior's Terrace. And here we did, um, so this part of the house is, is right over um, uh, here in this lower image. Um, here's our trellis in the back. The canopy is uh, coming in from the back side. And not shown in that lower image. Uh, it's a it's an interesting structure in itself. This it's a double cantilevered structure, um, really integrated into the rock formation. And um, here we actually did a reinforcement with uh, carbon fiber. It was uh, somewhat re overstressed, but not by a huge amount. So we told the um, uh, the folks at Falling Water that uh, if they're going to be redoing the roofing on on whoops apologies again on this terrace that uh, when you do that let's um, reinforce the beams with uh, carbon fiber and those beams were in, um, so we were able to uh, do that successfully there. Um, another project in 2002 was the reconstruction of the stair to the the stream, and you, I'll show you more images of this uh, coming up, but the stair was in really poor condition. Actually, if you look at this image on the right, these are suspending, these are hangers that were suspending the stair, uh, the, the stair treads. And you walk from the living room down the, down the stair, um, and then you're right above the stream over Bear Run. Um, but you can see, this was all done in mild steel with a lot of water getting right at the interface between the concrete and the steel. And so some of these uh, hangers were almost fully rusted through. Um, and you can see, if you look a little closer here, some of where the hangers were going through the steps, some of the concrete was falling off. So it was in poor condition. Um, we ended up rebuilding this. So this was a, actually an a, a example of a restoration where we rebuilt this stair these are actually structural columns that support one of the beams down to the, the stream bed. So they bear on the rock in the stream. So I'll show you more images of that. But this, the bottom two images are after the reconstruction and before any of the finished coatings were put on. So this was right after construction when the formwork was pulled away. Um, but the, the new construction here is all done with stainless steel and uh, reinforced concrete with stainless steel reinforcement. Um, here's an image after uh, from the underside. There's a few images that you're not going to see on your tour in this presentation. Um, so this is one which uh, you get to see from the underside if you're walking in the stream. 
Um, so here we're down, uh, we're down at the stream level, and now we're going to start talking about the main cantilever of the house, which is which goes over the falls at Bear Run. Um, the uh, so if you recall, this is the the two terraces and that are in the trellis beams are on the opposite side of this masonry wall. Here's our stair going down to the stream. So. Just to give you a sense of uh, this part of the structure, um, this is, uh, these are illustrations from a book on falling water by uh, Edgar Kaufman Jr., um, uh, the son of the uh, uh, Edgar Kaufman, the homeowner. And um, the, the illustrations are done by uh, Lou Astorino, um, uh, Pittsburgh architect at the time. So this is at the foundation level. You can see here there the main foundations. We're gonna we're gonna focus in on this area. This is where the the living room structure cantilevers off these foundations. There are three uh, reinforced concrete foundations we call bolsters that are integrated into the rock. This is a masonry foundation. This is the boulder that actually comes up and becomes the hearth of the fireplace. And this is and the mass of the the chimney rises above this. So I mentioned the foundations were reinforced concrete. And you see here, um, we will take the word reinforced lightly in that they were very lightly reinforced. Um, there's uh, just occasional bars coming up from the foundations and into what would be the beams of the living room that you're gonna run right along this and cantilever out. So here's an image again of the next level up. Here are our main beams of the living room that are uh, cantilevering off the foundation, which stops around here. So this cantilever is about 15 feet. It goes in that direction, um, in the north-south direction. And then also, it's a, again this double cantilever where this west terrace extends off um, to the west side, and then this one goes off the east. This curved beam is, this is where the stair goes down. And um, uh, this beam is actually supported by those columns at the bottom of the stair. So here's an image during construction. Clearly one of the challenges is creating all the formwork for the reinforced concrete. Um, and so you'll see some uh, replication of this necessity when we get into some of the construction that happened later. Um, going up, uh, we have um, the, uh, again, this is uh, Edgar Senior's Terrace. This is the master bedroom, and this is the master bedroom, uh, the master terrace coming off this way. Here's that structure that we're looking at with the trellis beams integral with that. So inside the living room, here's the finished view. It's you know, spectacular. This is right when you come in from the outside, you enter into the living room. Uh, these are two main masonry piers, which really mark the end of the foundations. And so everything beyond this is cantilevered. So this is about a 15 foot cantilever. And again, these terraces in turn cantilever off that. The stair down to the stream is right around this pier and you go down. The, um, the floor is uh, finished with, um, uh, there's a wood structure, you'll see some of this, and then uh, thin stone, uh, sandstone, with uh, Johnson wax finish. So when we got involved um, uh, in 1995, I was actually only two years on the job at uh, Robert Sillman Associates and uh, working with Bob and uh, others there. And um, the first image we, we saw when looking at this was um, uh, we were contacted because of these cracks that were happening at the master terrace level. And so these, uh, the story goes that when it in construction, um, when they pulled the formwork away, you saw the image of the formwork, uh, there was an immediate large deflection about, I think it was about an inch and three quarters and uh, the development of cracks right right here. And um, 
the request from Falling Water at the time initially was like, you know, we've had these cracks and they've uh, recurred over time. They keep opening up. And so every time they would open up, um, one of the forgiving aspects of the design is that uh, what you see on the surface is actually not the, the reinforced concrete. There's reinforced concrete, but then there's a thin coat of a stucco and a paint. And so um, every time the cracks would reopen, we'd, uh, they'd uh, re-stucco and paint and cover it back up. And then, um, and then maybe uh, sometime down the line, it would do the same again and reopen. Um, we actually, uh, there was actually a first engineering study for this was done in 1937, right after it was built. Um, so there was concern with, because of that initial deflection and the cracking. There was a history of monitoring from 1941 to 1955, I believe. There was a period of monitoring where there was continued, continued downward movement. So within that context and the fact that the cracks were still opening is where we came on to help try to solve this problem. And in their minds, initially, the main problem was at this master terrace level. Um, so here's our, those cracks on a closer view. But what we, uh, what we found is really we needed to look at this more holistically um, in terms of how this master terrace was relating to the rest of the structure. So we looked back at historic drawings. You can see the two cantilevers. Um, again, this idea visually is there's this thin plane of glass, sort of a clear story between the two main cantilevers of the house, the living room level and the master terrace level. Um, in the, uh, the shop drawings, there actually is a slightly more robust connection shown, and this actually proved to be a, a structural connection, so between the two levels, and we found that the two levels were working together. Um, in fact, these, uh, these frames here, these are steel frames that were embedded in the concrete. These are actually turned out to be functioning as structural links between the two levels. So they made sure the two levels were working together. Here's a, a section through the, uh, the, the living room. Here's one of our beams with the reinforcing at the top. So we looked at we looked at existing drawings, but then there we knew there was some question about the extent to which the existing drawings really represented what was actually built. So we brought in a, a, a group um, from uh, England. Uh, groups, the uh, company's called GBG, did non-destructive evaluation. They use a, a, a host of uh, non-destructive techniques, including impulse radar, ultrasonics, metal detection to basically uh, look at the condition of the concrete and also look, determine the layout of reinforcing in, within the concrete, because the reinforcing was critical to our understanding of how the structure works. And just the basic idea of reinforced concrete, the concrete part is, is resist, is very good in compression, but not good in tension when it's being pulled apart. The embedded reinforcing bars are what resist the, the tension in the in that composite material, and so the understanding the you know understanding the the overall geometry of the concrete is fairly straightforward, but knowing how much reinforcing was in there, if that was in question, uh, was it an important ambiguity that needed to be resolved. So in parallel to this, we also did some monitoring and. Um, there are lots of ways to monitor things. And uh, this one, this is uh, Earl Friend, who was actually uh, part of the staff at Falling Water since the original construction is my understanding. But um, uh, this method uh, they came up with, which was they, they knew they had some problems with the master terrace above they were concerned about deflections. So they say, well, if we fit this stick in between here, then uh, if it, as long as the fit stick, the stick fits, sorry, <laughs> as long as the stick still fits in there, then maybe the structure's not moving down. But, um, and sometimes low tech methods like that are very good. Unfortunately, in this case, there was a problem with this method because 
it wasn't just the master terrace that was potentially moving or was moving, it was actually the two levels together. So the, and if the two levels are moving together, then you might not necessarily get that reading from the stick method here. So if you put the stick underneath down to the stream bed, then you'd probably, that would actually work there. Um, so we, we, we use a different method in this case. We use uh, some more high tech, uh, we use what are called strain gauges and tilt meters and uh, crack meters um, to measure uh, the, this, the, on the top left is a crack meter that would measure the uh, change in, what, in, uh, in location between these two locations on either side of this crack. And so, and the tilt meter would, was like a pendulum over here on the ends of the structure that would show a rotation. And what we basically found was there was both daily and seasonal fluctuations. These things were moving back and forth. So in effect, the cantilever part of the house was lifting and, and moving down on very you know, small amounts on a regular basis with change in temperature. But then over a year and a half, there was still a downward trend overall. And that was the larger concern. So, uh, so we found, uh, so we did other kinds of uh, investigation. So um, this is me actually, so I was uh, new, new on the job. Uh, I got the job of climbing in the holes here. And uh, I like to make the joke that I was uh, 15 when I started this project, uh, look a little younger then. Uh, I wasn't quite 15, I was a little bit older. Um, but uh, so we did probes into the, into the floor of the living room, looked at the structure. Uh, we did structural analysis. Um, uh, and uh, again, this first model is looking just at the, the master terrace level as if it were operating on its own. We quickly found that the master terrace really wasn't designed to carry itself. It really had to put its weight on those columns at the end of the living room and down onto the living room floor below. So this is in the living room, it's an older image, but this is, these are those frames that were in the, that other drawing I was showing. And each of these big mullions are actually columns. They're steel T columns that come down and get embedded in here and help carry the weight of the master terrace above. So then we looked at the, uh, the way the structure, the two levels work together. We linked them up and, um, and quickly found that even still, um, the, this, there was a stiffness question at the top where the load the, wanted to go up here. There was a lot of geometric potential to resist load up at this level. However, it uh, really was not reinforced to do that. So it was sending load down below all onto these main beams in the living room. And what we quickly found was that those beams were not uh, strong enough to carry that load. And they were heavily over, overstressed. So, um, the, and which explained the continuous uh, deflections over time. And in terms of deflections, this cantilever was about 15 feet. It deflected about five inches in that 15 feet from here to there. And actually, even on this side, at this southeast corner of these terraces, the deflection was up to uh, seven inches relative to the supports. So we recommended uh, temporary shoring because we said, well, it's, we couldn't really predict um, how long it could last. In some ways, it was, it's been overstressed and in a slow failure mode for a long period of time, but the fact that it was still moving was definitely a concern. So we designed this temporary shoring. Um, the idea of it is to, uh, you know, take, relieve the, the weight of the cantilever, put it down on the stream bed. Um, we were actually concerned about that load because the, as I mentioned before, the, the, the rock itself was cantilever. You can see there's one of the uh, guys working down below here. We actually shored the cantilever rock to take whatever weight we were going to be adding all the way down. Um, so, but uh, the design was set back about four feet from the edge. So at least in 
you know, I, I took photos here to show it off, but I think typically when it was in shadow, you didn't see it as much. It was, it was a little bit uh, tucked away. So one of the, so now it came, to, once we had it temporarily shored and uh, it was safe for visitors again, in those cantilever parts, we, the, the question was, what do we do about this? What is the permanent fix? And certainly one of the options was, can we, do we leave this shoring in place? And um, we quickly, uh, and that's a perfectly reasonable structural solution. And uh, from a preservation philosophy in some ways, it's also reasonable. It's a clear distinction of old and new. And um, however, um, clearly in the end, this would have been a detraction to the design and really what uh, was most valuable in, uh, in the design that uh, Wright created. So we uh, did not uh, entertain the idea of permanent shoring for very long. But then, um, so the idea really quickly evolved to um, different op options for strengthening at the living room level. And the one we landed on was uh, what's called external post-tensioning. And so the, the diagrams on the left here, here's one of those beams, it's cantilevering. And uh, you can see these cracks that we're imagining. We did see cracks when we crawled in there. The idea is to do this external post-tensioning, this cable system in effect, that's external to the beam, but internal to the architectural finishes. So it would be below the floor level, but along, traveling alongside the beams. And so if we look at a plan view on the right here, this is where we ended up with these uh, post-tensioning strands, uh, tendons on either side of the beams, and I'll show you a little bit more about this. And then also we were doing some post-tensioning um, in the uh, east-west direction as well. So there's a great article that I recommend you all check out at some point but in Scientific American way back in 2002. And uh, uh, Bob Sillman uh, wrote the article and it's illustrated by Barry Ross, and um, who I found out later does some impressive illustrations of te technological topics and subjects. And um, so I, I, I like the, I think the, the narrative that Bob provides is, is very accessible and as are the uh, illustrations uh, in showing how this all comes together. And so and, uh, you can see in the construction here of, uh, of how, this, how the structure works, and then the idea of the post-tensioning is we will put some concrete blocks. We have these tendons in the floor level and, um, and uh, the, the tendons will get anchored into the side of the con existing concrete beams. And then we'll tension them from here and in effect pull the structure up and lift it up and counter the normal bending behavior of uh, the cantilever. So that's the, the idea. And it's, um, you know, post-tensioning has been around for a long time, but this, I think this was uh, a, a very innovative approach to use post-tensioning within uh, a preservation context and, uh, and especially in this, for this historic uh, structure. So, Construction began in 2001. So uh, I'll just dive right into the story of this. Um, the, uh, the, uh, this is a, a scaffolding getting ready to get access to the outside. The first task was to remove all the finishes from the interior and bring them out. Um, and because we were gonna be working from the top side and uh, and from this exterior area. And uh, at first we didn't think that they would want to uh, remove finishes, but they actually thought that they could take care of other issues like uh, electrical and uh, heating and other things while this was all going on. So it turned out to be uh, ben mutually beneficial. Um, the falling water staff themselves removed, labeled and removed all the stones of the floor. Um, the stones are about one to two inches thick and large, but um, you can see them there on the left. Uh, uh, and they were just 
uh, taken up the road and stored on site uh, while the project was ongoing. Uh, then uh, the subfloor was removed. These are, this is a redwood uh, subfloor on, on wood joists, like two by fours, spanning between the concrete uh, joists in the, uh, in the uh, structure. So this is an image of uh, the living room during construction. So uh, dramatically different look. And uh, um, I think it's a, you know, certainly for someone who hadn't, was, would, haven't, hasn't seen it yet, to be a shocking view. But um, uh, interesting view uh, in terms of the structure, as you see, um, if you look at the line of the beams, both middle and and west beams right at the end of the support here. This is the end of the foundation. There's definitely a distinct change in slope. And this is where that uh, five inches of deflection is occurring between here and here, it goes down five inches. And you can actually see it also in the, some of the uh, windows and doors with some racking and uh, overall, over time, the, uh, the window frames and door frames slowly adjusted to the, uh, deflecting structure. So now we're gonna install our post-tensioning and, and anchor the, these concrete blocks onto the side of the existing reinforced concrete beam. So uh, we started drilling in to create these anchorages. Here is what we call the dead end anchor of the post-tensioning where uh, these rods are going through. These are actually um, post-tension thread bars that are gonna get, that are gonna clamp a new block of concrete onto the side of the existing concrete beam. But then this is a conduit for these uh, post-tensioning strands that are gonna come through here and uh, get anchored into the concrete and transferred into the existing beam. So some reinforcing starting. Here's some more, this is at the south end. This is at the south parapet, which is the, the far end of the cantilever overhanging the stream. Um, these are those uh, post-tensioned uh, thread bars that are going through and uh, they haven't been stressed yet. So um, here now is our profile of the post-tensioning. It comes up, reaches a high point right above the end of the foundation. Then it goes down and, and, and uh, go down near the lower part of the beam uh, as you get out to the south end. And uh, what's going to happen is over at this south end, you're going to be applying a great uh, force on these uh, high strength steel strands. We're going to pour some concrete in here first to anchor it all in. Uh, and then that's going to pull up on that sagging end of the cantilever. Here's the, uh, we call a uh, mono strand tendons that are running, running across to the uh, uh, east and west terraces and clearly they haven't been stressed yet. They're sagging just be in place at this point. So no forces have been applied. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, the strands are uh, very high strength steel. Um, if I remember correctly, 270 KSI post-tensioning steel, uh, seven wire strands. These are 13 strands in this tendon here. So overall, the force that can be applied, um, we're actually going to end up applying about in the area of 400,000 pounds on each side of one of these beams. So, and uh, 43,000 pounds um, on each one of these cables here and these strands. So a lot of force being applied to the structure. So those strands, uh, the multi-strand tendons come out. And so this, though our beam is on, I mean, this is a straddling our beam and uh, right here, and these are coming out onto the scaffolding that's on the south side. We've, uh, there's a, there were a number of cracks that were uncovered when we opened those up and the decision was made to uh, 
epoxy inject those cracks, um, both to repair the individual members, but also to limit the amount of uplift that we would get when we apply those, those high forces. Um, because we, and one of the questions we always get is, uh, do we want to straighten out the, the structure because of all that deflection? Um, the concern was we, re we realized we were going to do a lot of damage to, if we were going to straighten that out, both to potentially to the structure, but more so to all the windows and door frames that had moved gradually over time. Like even in this image here, you could see this sort of uh, change in uh, racking of the, the door frames over there. So we would, uh, if we left these cracks open, this was a big crack in one of the main beams. If we left that open, then when we apply the force, it would move and as it closed. And uh, uh, we actually didn't want it to move that much. Um, so we injected those with epoxy. Um, so here's, uh, the work was done in the winter. So you see the, um, well, to minimize the impact on the tours and visitation. Uh, so there were, roofs over the structure to allow for some heating in those internal spaces. And um, this is, uh, here are the concrete trucks. We're gonna pour some concrete in the living room. And this uh, got very, felt very real after that when you're pouring uh, reinforced concrete uh, or, or pouring concrete, wet concrete into the living room floor at Falling Water. I realized there's a certain aspect that is um, irreversible here that we're, we're doing. And in general, we try to make our repairs as reversible as possible. In this case, we, we needed to uh, have some irreversible inter interventions with some of this pouring concrete. These are uh, stressing these blocks. So the monostrand could get stressed manually. Here, use the hydraulic jack to stress the big blocks on the multi-strand uh, main beams. Here's uh, those uh, seven wire strands coming out. Um, one of the, one of the um, uh, tendons. These are wedges that, um, so this, this uh, hydraulic ram basically fits over this head, pushes on these wedges, so when you, and then as it pushes there, it pulls on the strands, and then the, once you pull it enough and elongate those tendons, you, uh, we've applied a big force, then you can release it, and those wedges will lock it into place. Um, so we're ready to start stressing the post-tensioning. So I always throw in a joke here about, uh, we were talking about the post-tensioning and not the, the engineers and all involved. We were very confident uh, with the design, but uh, yes, it was a little bit stressful as well. Um, there was a group from Penn State that actually uh, came down and did monitoring through the construction. And so, uh, right here, there has strain gauges on those um, uh, embedded steel frames between the two levels, which proved to be important. And then um, these are these dial gauges that were uh, measuring any uplift that we would get when we apply the post-tensioning forces. So uh, here is a lot of interest in this project as it was happening. There's uh, Bob Silman right on the, the front lines there. and. Um, guy with the microphone in case there were some interesting uh, uh, things said. Um, and I was safely back here taking a photograph. Um, but uh, uh, the stressing uh, was, took place over two to three days. It was done in incrementally uh, so that we would gradually apply force and could watch what was happening over time. Um, and actually, on the first, after the first day, we got to about 50% of the load. And I went upstairs to the master terrace and looked at the, um, the master terrace parapet. And um, I saw this at the top of the parapet, which at first I was uh, very concerned about. I thought, this is not good. We're breaking something here. And um, uh, so this is like right at the top of one of those parapets and uh, something seemed to be crushing. And then I, I looked at it closer and I re remembered what the history of the deflections and cracking was up there. And as I mentioned before, uh, you know, every time it cracked and moved again, the solution was to 
patch the stucco and paint. And then it would crack again and, and move some more. And then he's patched the stucco and paint. So what I realized was happening was actually we were closing some of those cracks that were hidden below, um, below the stucco at this level. We didn't inject with epoxy up here. And so uh, this is actually the stucco buckling and uh, the crack, cracks below closing up, which um, was in some level reassuring that we were seeing uh, how that was going on. And so here, uh, this, is the, this is where that uh, close-up view was taken. Um, these are some carbon fiber rods that were shallow, embedded 3 8 diameter, that were just in, not to support the main load, but just put in there for crack control in the future, because these parapets were very lightly reinforced. So this was just for uh, crack control in the future. But um, so, um, but anyway, we actually lifted up the structure a little bit. Uh, some places uh, just just barely above zero, and then a maximum of about three quarters of an inch in one area, where we lifted it up off the shoring. So uh, here we are after the stressing is done. Some happy engineers, uh, Bob Silman in the middle, uh, me slightly younger on the left, um, uh, Mario. Suarez from Schubeck Suarez was our post-tensioning consultant, was expert in post-tensioning, uh, uh, worked with us in there, and he was there on that final day. And Jason Hughes, who was representing the contractor of uh, VSL, uh, was on site and, uh, you know, throughout the whole process. It was a happy day for us. And then uh, we left it to Falling Waters uh, crew to put it all back together, uh, all the finishes. So all the stones, the floor, subfloor went back, the, the stones went back in place. Um, and this is actually a view after uh, the work was done. Um, and uh, again, uh, the, the idea of, the, of our work was that it was um, within the floor, within the architectural finishes. So really there's no evidence of what we did. And, uh, but hopefully, um, you know, it was a, a successful way of, you know, strengthening the structure and allowing for uh, many more years of, of future use. Here's some more uh, after construction shots. You know, all the, this had all been lifted up. This is all back in place now. You can see the, uh, still this, the underside hadn't been painted yet. This is where that temporary shoring was, but now the shoring's gone and, um, Oops. And this, I'll leave you with this final image. Um, you can see, uh, in, in here we are. This was a, a more, much more recent image. Uh, you see a tour going on on the, on the far left uh, of the structure. And unfortunately, right now, that's, um, we're in a period where that's not happening. So um, as uh, Justin mentioned at the beginning, um, uh, they're hopeful that um, there could be some generous donations to help. Uh, keep uh, this uh, site, wonderful site, up and running and uh, being maintained. And uh, the link is down below. But with that, I think I will uh, turn the floor over to Scott or Justin and uh, happy to answer any questions. John, that was a fascinating presentation. And you know, the, the solutions that you devised, they're so, so sophisticated, yet at the same time, truly, truly elegant. Um, and the fact that they're all hidden within the structure um, out of you, preserving the original forms, truly remarkable. Thank you for that. And all of the diagrams and photos you shared, some that we'd never seen before, um, really informative. Um, and, and as John mentioned, be part of Falling Waters Preservation Story. We appreciate any amount that you can give to ensure the house's long-term preservation for well into the future. So I saw a bunch of questions uh, pop up throughout uh, the presentation. So I think Scott was tracking those. So we'll turn it over to Scott to field some Q&A. So yeah. if there are um, people that still want to stay on with us, uh, we can answer some questions. Sure. Um, John, one of the earliest questions had to do with historic photography of the site and um, and how that was kind of utilized. And I'm wondering if you could just talk about some of the resources. You mentioned original drawings that are in the Falling Water Archives, but these other 
images that might have helped you with your work? Oh yeah, no, we definitely, um, we relied on the original drawings, but then also uh, there was a lot of photography um, that uh, definitely revealed details of the construction that was, that was helpful. Um, I, I don't know uh, who, who did that photography, so, but it's, it's a, a great part of the record. And, and Scott, you may know better, but the, um, and also I, I uh, in preparation for this, I watched the uh, Saving Falling Water uh, video, which is at the bookstore um, uh, last night. And there's some uh, vi uh, film footage of the construction as well mm -hmm. in that, which so uh, a lot of uh, great resources to uh, pull the, the story of the construction together in, in a lot of ways in order to figure out how to uh, how to fix something like uh, a structure like falling water uh, we really have to get our heads back into the original design and understand both how they designed it and how they built it and then um, that helps us uh, recreate that load path and how it's working today and sort of recreate a structural history of the building over time and that way we can um, really uh, make the least intervention in, uh, in doing what we have to do to, to keep it alive for the future. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those uh, historic photographs, we have about 60 in our collection were all taken by the Coffins department store photographer. Okay, great. Who yeah. sent out here to kind of document the progress for Mr. Kaufman. Um, we've got a question here about, um, the reinforcing bars and whether the there's this, this great story about the deviations of of um, Wright's engineering um, by having Kaufman bring in his own expert and wondering if you could speak to that and then um, any changes that have been made you know I know with the trellis beams we increased um, reinforcement a little bit there too yeah yeah no um, well one of the things uh, that um, we knew going in uh, when we were doing our initial research was the, uh, the original drawings showed a certain amount of reinforcing. They actually, each of the beams had showed eight uh, one inch square steel reinforcing bars. And, and we, um, we actually were able to test the bars. Um, they were uh, uh, what we would call today um, probably 40 KSI steel, the yield strength of the steel. Um, and, uh, but there was, a, a, a narrative of, in construction, the construction correspondence that the contractor and their engineer, uh, Metzger Richardson, Richardson, who supplied, who did the steel shop drawings and also supplied the steel, um, decided to double the reinforcing in those main beams because they were concerned. And um, so we actually found that they did double the reinforcing through that non-destructive testing. Uh, we were able to determine that and actually, and we actually did chip away some concrete in some areas to see some of those bars. So they, they, the reinforcing was doubled and even with that, um, it wasn't enough. And the level of overstress was, uh, was very high um, to the point where it was nearing the ultimate strengths of the steel and the concrete. And so that was, why we were getting that uh, slow uh, but steady uh, movement over time, and we were really a precarious situation. But um, uh, so yeah, so the, the the contractor did, and their engineer did decide to double the reinforcing. We verified that, and um, in the for the trellis beams, yeah, we we went back with more reinforcing because uh, mostly because of. Uh, we probably allowed for other scenarios like more maintenance, people walking on the trellis beams and things like that, but then also a consideration of what we call a uh, creep in the, in the reinforced concrete structure. Because some of those beams um, over time, what happens with concrete is it, it'll slowly, when it's under sustained compression, it'll compress and then it'll slowly sag. Uh, in, a, in a beam like that, like some of the trellis beams. And so by putting more bars, especially at the top, um, we were able to both provide enough strength and then also long-term resistance to deflection or creep. 
And um, scrolling down here through the Q&A uh, window, any major um, engineering projects lined up for the future? Well, we've got two, but maybe you could touch on those. Okay, yeah, sure. Um, we are uh, we are looking at, uh, there's, I remember I mentioned those foundations were lightly reinforced. Um, there, uh, what we're, we have a project there where there's some washout of some stones and also some cracking in the foundations below the living room level where we are going to do some reinforcement. Um, and there we're looking at a, uh, a, uh, a cementitious fiber-based surface reinforcement uh, below that on that surface. And then also um, the uh, uh the bridge we're re we're going to be um re replacing the parapets on the bridge that have been uh, a regular maintenance item over the over since the beginning of uh the construction and actually the bridge deck has already been replaced uh previously and so these parapets are now um going to get replaced unfortunately they're so far gone and been patch on top of patch that we have to replace them so th those are the the two projects. Uh, one project I didn't discuss, which is a small one, which was interesting, um, is the uh, with the mother and child sculpture. I think you can still see that image on the screen. Uh, is that right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, um, uh, and th that uh, there was a big flood. Sometimes the, the the stream rises to above, well above the lowest uh, landing of the stair, and there was a big storm, and that uh, a big tree log came down the the stream and knocked the sculpture over and uh damaged the uh the wall around there and so there was some work in that area too but um that was a recent project but. and a couple of questions about your favorite part of the building oh okay <laughs> what is your favorite part of the building oh okay <laughs> <laughs> I, I i think that, well i mean you know it's like uh it's one of those things where it's tough to pick a favorite, but um, there's so many amazing parts of this design. And uh, I'll be honest, every time I go to the site, and I've been there many times, I, it seems like I, I, I uh, learn something new or appreciate something even more uh, on the next visit. So, um, so I'm sure that's a, a bit of a moving target in terms of what my favorite part is, but um I, I love the canopy design uh i think it's a amazing successful design uh and um and uh and so i, I if i had to pick one right at this moment that would be it i, I would certainly be very happy to be swimming in the guest pool that's another great part yeah. of the design. <laughs> you're not allowed to swim there so, you know, yeah. as a guest yeah. uh, <clears throat> Um, so anyway, that, I would say structurally, uh, I think the, the canopy and that tr whole transition from the, the, the canopy to the covered bridge and the trellis, I think is uh, a part of the design that I, within these last few years, I really have come to appreciate much, much more. Great. Uh, question here about addressing any future corrosion of the post-tension cables, good for 100 years or more? The um, the 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 post-tensioning cables, so that was actually one of the questions during um, the uh, peer review. I didn't mention it. We had a big event uh, after we came up with the design and we were getting ready for the construction and uh, was about the long-term durability. Um, those conduit are, uh, that, you showed, that I showed you uh, that are with, that the uh, post-tensioning strands are in are actually grouted solid. Um, so there's a, uh, uh, a very fluid grout that uh, goes in around the post-tensioning strands and is uh, providing long-term protection uh, for them. So in theory, you know, I think there's a, a you know, as long as uh, there's not active moisture coming through the roof into the living room, down through the floor, I think the uh, this is a very very long term uh, solution. Great. Um, I've got a couple of questions here that pertain to ADA accessibility and preservation. 
I was wondering if you wanted to sort of talk about that as a kind of a topic of interest and in how you kind of make those decisions when you're preserving historic buildings. Yeah, no, and, and um, I'll, I'll say right off the bat that, you know, as a, that that's clearly within the architectural realm and usually we'd be, those sort of decisions would be done hand in hand with an architect. And this, mm -hmm. this part of the project and some of these projects that I've discussed today were unusual in that um, they were really focused uh, almost uh, uh, exclusively on structural issues, which um, of course there were uh, uh, related architectural issues that, and, uh, and conservation issues with the whole living room. There was, that's a whole other story that I'm not uh, talking about and the, all the waterproofing, as I mentioned, was a whole other story. Um, but uh, ADA access is, is always, an, you know, especially when you have a historic house that becomes, uh, moves into the public realm, uh, is an uh, important consideration. And, uh, as, and, and generally the architect is, takes the lead on that issue and we will, um, we will, it, it's always, uh, there are uh, creative ways of, overcoming that and, and uh, you know, making the structure as accessible as possible. Um, and a lot of times, certainly there are areas that are gonna be inaccessible in a house like falling water. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, so, so we, uh, you know, as a design professional, we, um, we uh, try to be as creative as possible and balance those current uses, modern use with, um, just like with the post-tensioning, how do we minimize any negative impacts to the design? And uh, you may know more specifically about uh, what happens at Falling Water in terms of ADA access, but I, I, I didn't have to get too much involved with those issues here specifically. Yeah, right now the, the, you know, the access to the house is closed, but um, typically we had a first floor experience um, that could be accessed by wheelchair. And then we created a 3D uh, video of the remainder of the house tour so that um, you could still get the experience of being in the house um, visually. Um, and I thought it was always a great um, tool because it showed you the house at different times of the day, different seasons than the one you were probably visiting in. So that's part of a, a special tour that we do um, here at Falling Water. Um, Scrolling through here, um, we've gone over a little bit, so I'm, maybe I'm trying to find one part of, or one more question here that we can kind of end with. Um, oh, somebody asked if you would repeat that quote about the stream and um, uh, near the beginning of the presentation, maybe that'll be the last uh, question we'll take. Water making the path of least resistance. Oh, okay. Um, well, that, uh, that uh, well, so there's the, um, what Wright said about it, um, which was that he he wanted the design to be an accompaniment to the music of the stream. So I think uh, clearly he was uh, very much focused on that. Um, what I had said, and this is just something I jotted down, so I was kind of probably had my looking down reading this, but um, um, what I said was, um, uh, like water winding its way down a rocky slope, the flow of forces through a complex structure can similarly follow varied paths, whereas water follows the path of least resistance, forces in a structure generally follow the path of greatest resistance. And then uh, I talked about Hardy Cross, uh, who had used um, this uh, moment distribution method or, uh, Hardy Croft's method of analyzing both structures and the flow of water through a uh, piping system. So it's kind of, and, I, and, it's, and, I, and it can be used also for electrical flows through various circuits. So it's, it's an interesting analogy about the flow of, of forces uh, through various things. And I think it's very fitting metaphor for understanding falling water um, and that it's really fundamental to the design is this, the stream this idea of uh, you know gravity taking the water down to the lower levels and and how this all ties into the way falling water works structurally is as a, a nice um, connection for me. Great. Well, um, 
I mean, I think I want to thank you, first of all, for joining us and, and speaking so wonderfully and eloquently on your work here. Um, Justin, I don't know if you have any closing comments you want to make about um, what we heard. Uh, just, again, thank you, John. Uh, you know, it's structural engineering is not easy for lay people to understand, but you were able to describe it in a way that connected with all of us. So. Um, thank you again for joining us today and for everyone that signed on to be with us. We just hope we can uh, reopen to the public soon after we all get past the current crisis. And hopefully everyone that signed on today can join us on site sometime in the future and enjoy so we can all enjoy falling water together. But thank you all so much and we, we appreciate you joining us. Bye everyone. <laughs>